My name is Scott Davis. I'm the founder and executive director of Medium Photo. <clears throat> I'd like to share that we're broadcasting to you today from San Diego, California, which is unceded land of the Kumeyaay people. And I want to acknowledge and thank the Kumeyaay people for sharing this space with us and allowing us to live on this land with them. I'm proud to welcome Larry McNeil uh, to medium to present a talk about his work today. Um, I can tell you anecdotally that uh, I was a self-taught photographer and at a certain point in my career I decided to go to school which means I had to sign up for a class and I went I picked up my life and I moved to the to New Mexico um, and attended the University of New Mexico and Larry was my first photo teacher and after that first class um, literally the first meeting of the class, he pulled me aside and kicked me out because he said, I think you need to go to the next class higher because you've been, you've been doing this a little too long for the level of this class. And he kindly handed me over to Patrick Nagatani, who was then my second photo teacher. Um, but that said, it's, uh, it's kind of a personal pleasure to have Larry here um, and a, a, a remarkable gift that we get to learn about his work as well. So please help me welcome Larry McNeil. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great story. I love that. And, and thank you for being here. You know, it's sincerely appreciated, especially in these times, you know, and uh, we're all just trying to make it out of this COVID thing, right? And trying to normalize our lives. And I, I think this is such a wonderful way of doing it. Um, especially winning a camera bag. <laughs> I've never been to a talk where I won a camera bag before. <laughs> so good mojo, you know, so good luck. Yeah, so again, thank you for being here. And um, here's, here's some of the photographs I have on my portfolio site. And it's a lot of different bodies of work that goes back 30 years or so. And I keep going back to this same thing and, you know, wondering why I got into photography in the first place. And, and I use photography to try and make better sense of the world. And you know what? It's kind of working and it's kind of not because I still don't get it. <laughs> well, kind of get it, you know, but photography has definitely, definitely helped. And, and being a... Um, professor and an artist is walking this tightrope too and, and I'm sure you know a lot of you professors can identify with that you know just um, and especially being an, an indigenous uh, person and here here we are near, we're nearly the end of the semester right now and um, and I always feel like this this is this is no joke. This is seriously how I feel. You know, it's like, okay, the scholar is, is the guy on the right. Now I get to be the guy on the left. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> take that hat and just kind of spin it off over the horizon for a bit and, and, and go back to being an artist, just like a lot of you. So I, I usually don't share student work and um, but this has been such a life-changing experience for myself because I, I feel like I'm learning just as much as they are. You know how to how to navigate this new world and especially via Zoom. So with my class, I asked them to, you know, I didn't want them. I taught them how to write artist statements, but I also I wanted them just to write a story. You know, say okay, just write a one-page story about everything you've been through, you know, and this is 2021, this is last year, you know, all, all the things they've had to navigate. And, and this was one of them, you know, one of the students work and we we're doing it via Zoom. And um, it was amazing. It was really great. You know, the whole class really came through and, and they were talking about their life experiences, you know, with, with navigating. And, and one of the common themes was they wanted to get out of the house. You know, just like the rest of us. And I said, well, you know what? Put it in your story. And, you know, and, 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 and this person, you know, put their easy chair, you know, out. One of the reasons I, I live in Idaho is because it's such beautiful country. And it's uh, halfway between the southwest and the northwest, you know. And, uh, 
and this is, um, I, I, ta I taught them how to do lighting via Zoom. How do you like that? Wow. <laughs> that was pretty challenging, but you know what? It worked. You know, and, and we had the benefit of having these really beautiful lighting studios at school. And, and if you, you know, you could go in there by yourself and, and I described how to use the lighting and so forth. And um, they did a really amazing job. And, and you know what? After they did that, I said, you know what? Here's what you should do. A lot of the students were sent home from school to live at home. You know, so, so that was pretty radical in itself because parents wanted them to be at the school. <laughs> you know, and, and I could identify with it because I have a son who was a senior um, in college right when COVID hit. So he came home, he was home too. And um, so I said, okay, here's what you do. A lot of the students were living in their basement and said, you know what, you can buy these cheap lighting systems, you know, and green screen. I taught them how to use a green screen and stuff, chroma key, and I said, you know what, for, for less than $200, you can buy a lighting system and I can teach you how to do photography in your basement. <laughs> and, you know, so some of them came up with, you know, just amazing works like this, you know, it was a part of their visual narratives, you know, about what they've been experiencing, you know, with the mask wearing and all that kind of thing. And look at that, that's how I look. <laughs> so so I, I did the scream catcher, you know, just this spring when I was, we were having a critique and you know, there's my poker face right there. <laughs> I wanna do a, a, a quick flashback, flashback. You know, this is one of my, I think this is the first photograph I made that really worked. I was 20 years old in photography school and we had some really tough professors, and and he, when I was, when we were doing this critique, he pulled out his red sharpie, and he wrote all over my beautiful print. <laughs> you know, he'd put you know this, this, and this, and he said, "You need to go reshoot this." And so I did. I reshot it, and he said, "Shoot it with a plain black background. It'll look way better." And, and it did. You know, so so I fully credit my own teachers too. You know, for making me a better photographer. And so another couple of years, you know, I was 22 and making photo photographs. And this is the first photograph I made that kind of defines my own style, you know, because it includes a lot of things like um, subtle humor, you know, seeing this scene. And this was in um, New Mexico. And, and I was just traveling there during the winter time. And, and, and I was driving on Route 66, and I was just zooming past, and I saw this scene. I thought, what was that? <laughs> so I did a U-turn and went out, and I made a photograph, did a show portrait. And, and um, I really loved the subtle kind of humor in it, you know, and along Route 66. And uh, there's me smiling for the camera. <laughs> Flash forward again. So one of the things I had to do when um, when I started making a living as a photographer was advertise. So that was a quirky kind of thing. So there, were, there it was. And I started out my career doing um, work like this. This was in Western Alaska, and it's kind of in the documentary style. And I really loved it. It was an ongoing project. It took probably two years to shoot the whole thing. So it's, a, it's an extended project and just, these are just a couple of photographs from this series. And of course, a lot of these um, Yupik ladies have passed on, her name's Mrs. Canrelak. And you know, this was the traditional way of uh, picking the grass. They call it saltwater grass when they coil their baskets. And that's what it looks like. And. Um, when, when I was doing this project, I, I had a Eugene Smith book in my camera bag, <laughs> you know, because I was inspired by Eugene Smith and the way in his light. So when I walked into the scene, um, she was backlit, and I pulled out Eugene Smith's book, and I was noticing the beautiful light. I said, "I'm going to do it like him." <laughs> so totally inspired by him, and I, I moved the couch beside the window and. I asked her to just do her work how she usually does it. So 
I, I guess that's not real um, photojournalism because I was moving stuff around, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but I made, you know, I made it match the light. So a couple years later, I was asked to participate in an exhibition about um, the Columbus Quincentennial, you know, 1992, and it was at a Photographic Resource Center in Boston, and. At first I said, no, I don't want to do this. You know, I don't want to do this work about Columbus. So, <laughs> so after thinking about it a few months, I reconsidered that, you know what, this, this would be a, a challenge, you know, to make work about what it means to be an indigenous person living in the Americas 500 years after Columbus arrived. So I decided, tried a lot of different experiments and ended up using feathers as kind of a metaphor for Native American identity. And I love the simplicity of it, you know, just very simple, you know, and um, things like this, you know, this was a, another version of it titled, oh yeah, this other one, titled 1491, you know, of course the year before Columbus arrived and America full of hope, you know, and. And for, this one's titled Elders, and um, this, one's, this one's titled 1492, the year of Columbus. And this was a challenge too, you know, because I was thinking, how would I make one photograph that talks about, you know, the arrival of Columbus and how so many things changed, you know, in the Americas and in, in the world, you know, so. Again, you know, I was looking for simplicity, telling a visual story with it. So we had an exhibition at um, the Smithsonian that featured the work, and, and I was working with um, Shauna Hannell, you know, fully credit her. She was helping, ma helping me make the platinum prints. And I had learned how to use, make platinum prints about 20 years before this. And, um, it just has this different look to it, you know, making the platinum photographs. And you know Bostick and Sullivan upstairs? I love Bostick and Sullivan. <laughs> you know, and Dick Bostick has been a good friend for more than 30 years, you know, and, and he, he'd come into my classrooms when I taught in Santa Fe, and he'd teach our students the process. And I don't know if, how many of you have worked in platinum and palladium, but it's pretty complex. And, much to his credit, he made it easy. You know, he made it, you know, and, and um, so I like the definition of the humanities as the ideas, stories, words, and art that helps us make sense of the world that doesn't always make sense. You know, so, so there we are again, you know, still trying to make sense of the world. And of course, that's what all of us are doing, right? I mean, all you photographers, that's what I've been seeing here, which is why I really love being here. I see that that's what other photographers have been doing all these years too. You know, they're just trying to, um, using the humanities, you know, to tell stories and so forth. So this first body of work, or third body of work, is titled Fly by Night Mythology. And it references our Northwest Coast creation story that has Yech, or Raven, as a protagonist. As part of her own creation story, she, he brought light to the world. This is a great metaphor for the entire series. Yech is all, also a rebellious rascal. <laughs> so, so for me, this was perfect, you know, because I could use, you know, tell these different stories you know, using Raven, you know, as uh, both female and male, you know, telling stories. So this is one of them. Um, this one is titled uh, In the True Spirit of White Man. It was made in 2002 and um, lots of different processes. You know, I still love shooting film. So I shot it with film and, and I was noticing um, in my dark room, I, I, I put butcher paper down on the um, countertops and, and that's what it looked like after about a year. <laughs> you know? so, so I was standing there making some negatives and, and I thought, wow, that's a, that's, that, 
that's better actually, it looks pretty cool. <laughs> so so I, you know, I photographed it and scanned it in and just used it as kind of an abstract background for this print, that print that I was making. And, and this one came, regarding process, it came straight out of a journal. You know, so, so I work with, you know, journals. And so I'm gonna, so here's what it says. This, this it says, um, in the true spirit of white man, I stole this car in my search for America. <laughs> Just call it manifested destiny. <laughs> I asked the owner to take my picture in front of his car before I took it. <laughs> and I, and I, showed him, I assured him this was God's will that I take his car. <laughs> and uh, God made, meant for me to take this fine machine and I'll be flying down the freeway, I told him. Are you a real Indian, he asked. I thought you were all vanished. As soon as you give me the keys, I'll be another vanishing Indian, I told him. <laughs> can you look more noble? I told him, sorry, this is a stoic I can manage for now. <laughs> he asked if I had any regalia to put on, you know, to make it look more authentic. This is as real as it gets, I told him. <laughs> I saw in a book that you people were all vanished, he said again. I asked him if he still had his native culture and who is the vanished one, you or me? He told me that his grandfather was Edward Curtis and that he made some of the best photographs ever of Indians before they vanished. Like me? Kind of. Thanks for the car, I told him, but I got some serious vanishing to catch up on. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so there it is. <laughs> so anyway, I had fun with it, and, and and again, you know, I like the the writing because the writing for me has been always been kind of nearly stream of consciousness writing. You know, just pull out a journal, and just write whatever, and don't always plan what I'm going to write. And um, so here, here's part of the, this is process, by the way. <laughs> you know, so this is how we work. I got my journal out, and I got super guy off to the side, and <laughs> yeah, and uh, and coffee. I love coffee. <laughs> you know, so uh, this is another one. It's titled "Fly Don't Walk." This one was a little interesting because I made the first version in, in 1987. And I did it analog. It was completely analog, you know. So a lot of darkroom work, cutting and pasting, and rephotographing. And and you know what? It was really a perfect uh, photograph to be doing digitally, you know. Because so 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 years later, so in, in 1998, I go ahead and I took the old one, and I used Photoshop to remake it. So this is like Fly Don't Walk Part Two. <laughs> And uh, part of it was, you know, me living in San Francisco, and I. This is the scene. The white wall was what I'd see every time I got off Bart, you know, off the subway. You know, I'd see that every day. So one day I thought, you know what? I'm going to bring my camera with me, and I'm going to photograph this thing. And right when I did it, you know, some a bird was flying by, and so it came out of a journal entry, you know, again, fly don't walk. After watching a bird and shadow dance on a very white wall, I was going to cross the street, but came to a don't walk sign. Finally, the red hand turned into the figure of a white man walking. Not wanting to offend anyone, I did my best imitation of a white man walking <laughs> across the street. <laughs> so, so, so there we have it. And, um, in 1998, I was part of a project with a commissioned artist to make public art. And so this one was for a billboard in, in, in Albuquerque. You know, and who, who's been to Albuquerque here? You, yeah, you know what Albuquerque's like, right? So, so anyway, I wanted to make a, a billboard that was specifically for um, Albuquerque, <clears throat> of course, using Raven, you know, and um, it's titled Cosmological Status. So the creator made humans in Raven's image, sort of. It was another heck of a day. <laughs> and um, 
what I found a little interesting, because I, I, I had a book from the Smithsonian. It was published in 1902. And there was this quirky scientist. He was trying to make the argument that humans evolved from birds. Who knows? Maybe he's right. I don't know. <laughs> but but that's, a, that's a real illustration from the book. You know, <laughs> you know. So I was thinking, right on, man. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, I've got science on my side. <laughs> yeah, so it's bona fide. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so this one got made into a, a billboard, and um, and, the, and the equation on the bottom left was real too. I didn't make that up. You know, it was somebody was talking about. There's an author who was talking about rules of cultural diffusion, and I was doing a lot of reading. Well, I was in graduate school, so I read his book. And so I scanned in his, his equation. And the only thing I changed was I put an equal sign in a banana at the end. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is actually from a real story. And it's titled um, Gingolith, or Gingolic. And it's a village where my father's from in, in Canada. And it's about keeping the peace. Because back in ancient times, we lived in prime territory. So this was more than 10,000 years ago. You know, our, our, the Nishka people, you know, we had some of the best property on the Northwest coast, you know, in addition to the Haidas and Tlingits, you know, and, and so forth. And what was happening at the village what was constantly being invaded year after year after year, decade after decade after decade. The neighboring tribes would invade, you know, the village, and and there was always wars and fights and battles and taking of slaves and unnecessary lives taken and so forth. And my aunt, who was a woman chief, told me the story. She said, "You know the story of Gingolic, don't you?" And she said, "What happened was, in order to get the peace, the matriarchs." Um, decided to capture the neighboring chiefs and cut their heads off and plant them on the beach. So after that, there was peace. <laughs> you know, and, uh, so anyway, that, that's what it's about. So I asked my dad about it. You know, he was his uh, eldest from, of his siblings. And I was telling him my plan. I said, you know what? I want to photograph some skulls and tell the story. And I asked him if that would be OK. You know, because it was controversial, and it still is. And, and he said, well, go ahead and make it and show it to me. So I did. I made it, and I showed it to him. And he put it on his kitchen table, and he, and he put on his reading glasses. Then I was really worried. Because <laughs> I was fully prepared to tear it up and throw it away. And he looked at me, and he said, can you make me a bigger one? <laughs> he wanted a big one for his living room. So, so that was the seal of approval. So anyway, the story, you know, it says, King Coleth, the name of our village, translates to place on the beach where enemy skulls are planted. It helped us live in peace, and an added bonus was that we didn't have any many Jehovah's Witness types ringing our doorbells. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dark time in our history. Anyone got any spear skulls hanging around? <laughs> so, what, what was interesting was that this was a, a kind of a labor of love. It took a lot of work to shoot this because, you know, I had to make so many photographs in the studio, and you know, had to find a skull, and, and, uh, and um, you'll have to ask my assistant Igor about that one. <laughs> Um, 59 Cadillacs. So I got this thing about 59 Cadillacs. They show up in a lot of my work. And I'll talk about that a little later. And this one is from a series called Raven Ass Pontiac. And it's about Pontiac um, being turned into a um, stereotype, you know, this chief of the Ottawa. So, so I did these. Um, pieces in a studio that was telling the story of, um, of, of how George Washington, when he was um, a young man, fought for the British, you know, in the Ottawa country and, um, and lost. You know, the British lost that battle. 
And, and that's not, and, and the reason, the, the thing that got this series made was because my son was in kindergarten and he came home singing a patriotic George Washington song, you know? So I thought, wait a minute, he, my son is being indoctrinated, <laughs> you know? So, so that's what motivated this series, you know? It's, it's about George Washington and, and, and how um, he fought for the British. I was going, wait a minute, I didn't know he fought for the British. And it has Raven, you know, telling the story. And, um, and again, you know, doing studio work and, and experimenting with platinum and different processes and so forth and doing the collage work. So the, the collage work seemed to work for the, you know, really well for telling the story and experimenting with how it looked. So it, I, I wrote a chapter for one of the texts. It's called, titled Visual Currencies, Reflections on Native Photography, and edited by Henrietta Leachel and Halia Senegini. And um, it was for the National Museum of Scotland. They're the ones who published it, you know, so. And they put this one on the cover, this photograph. How many people have shot Polaroid Type 55? I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and so anyway, it's titled Mass, Mass, and More Mass, and you know, using the Lone Ranger, you know, as kind of a storyteller, and Tonto, and me in there. And it, it, what it's about is about Edward Curtis using fake people for his photographs, you know, and, and especially whenever any sitters were wearing masks. A lot of times those were his assistants, you know. So, so there's a lot of documentation, you know, that talks about that. And I, anyway, I like the idea of using uh, these vintage, you know, TV characters, uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto. And I actually made a print to go inside a print. So, so you see that print up there, I actually made that, you know, and used it as kind of a cartoon poster for it. And, and Tonto is talking to uh, Edward Curtis. And he said, your vanishing Indian paradigm just doesn't fit our native epistemology. Here's two deconstructionist theories. <laughs> and he punches out Edward Curtis. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Tonto gives Edward Curtis a lesson in native values. <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm just standing in front documenting all this stuff, you know, with the, with the camera. <laughs> so a few years later, I was commissioned by the Arts and Embassies um, program to make a photograph. And it kind of caught me off guard because I said, I asked them, you know who I am, right? <laughs> you know, I'm the guy who makes fun of uh, stuff, you know, it's satirical. And um, I said, oh yeah, we know, we know. And, and so, so, I, so I ran the idea by them. You know, I said, okay, this is gonna be a satirical, it's, it's a lithograph, you know, so it's made with a master lithographer. And um, what I wanted to do with it was I wanted to actually take Edward Curtis's flagship photograph, you know, and, and it's titled The Vanishing Race, and it looks kind of like this. And um, only change it, you know. So instead of it being the vanishing race, it's natives going off to a ceremony, you know. So it's not about vanishing Indians. It's about Native Americans who are continuing, you know, and continuing to practice our ceremonies and so forth. And I really love the idea of the old truck, you know, the old res truck off to the side. And so, and, and, um, now with this photograph, it was kind of tricky too because I wanted to put the names of a lot of the native nations in this. And I was asking the, the, my collaborator um, if I could use invisible ink. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's what a trickster would do, right? We'd, when we're making a lithograph, one of the plates will be invisible ink. She said, yeah, we can do that, sure. So, so, I, so I made all the words and um, when you look at this lithograph straight on, it's invisible. You can't see it. But if you stand at a 45 degree angle to it, all the words just kind of come out like magic. 
And I was thinking, yeah, that's great, that's perfect. And, and it worked, you know, so it was total experimental. I had no idea whether it would work or anything, but I loved the way it turned out, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, and um, I collaborated with a master printer, and he's Brooke Steiger. So Brooke, if you're out there, thank you very much. You're such an awesome printer, great to work with. And, and this was uh, at the University of New Mexico, um, where we did the work at, at the Tamarind uh, Institute. Such a great place to uh, do collaborative work. So later on, I started doing this work about global climate change, and I felt very strong about it, so strong about it that I gave up my car in 2008 and became a bicycle commuter. So, in, so whereas living in Idaho, we get snow. <laughs> so, so before I, you know, before I decided to become a bicycle commuter, I thought, okay, I better get ready to ride in the snow too. And, and in the summertime, it gets to be 105. You know, so a lot of different climates to be riding in, riding your bike in. So, so we did another lithograph, and it's titled "Bonehead Humans." <laughs> You know, and again, using uh, Raven as a protagonist. And one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, asking, doing the research on what is the most popular photograph of planet Earth, you know, because it's about the planet. So I did some research and learned that it was um, by far the most popular photograph is called the Blue Marble, and it's from NASA. And it's in the public domain, you know, since the taxpayers paid for it, you know, we own it. So in the pub, since it's public domain, I could use it for the lithograph. But I always credit them. I say, yeah, this came from NASA, you know, came from one of their satellites in this stunningly beautiful photograph. So the experimental part was to make a lithograph out of it and make it look like a photograph. And in theory, you should be able to do it pretty easily use cyan, magenta, yellow, and black inks, and if you register them, it should look like a photograph. But he had never done it before, so we were just like, okay, let's blow in the dice and toss them out there, man. Let's see what happens. And uh, it worked. But our creation story has Raven stealing the sun from a wealthy aristocrat, so I drew this out. and. Uh, Raven was white before he stole the sun. Time to steal the earth from those bonehead humans. <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah. Boise power lines. I made this on one of my, um, while I was riding my bike, I saw this scene and just stopped and photographed it. And uh, this one, to me, more than any other photograph, this one seemed very intuitive. You know, it just felt right, you know, and, Here's a photograph that's, um, this was actually made as, a, as public art, you know, and um, I had, this was really challenging to make, you know, because I had some ideas about, you know, how I wanted to lurk. You know, there's my bike over on the right, and there's Tonto and, you know, the Lone Ranger, and, and there's that same photograph up in the corner, and um, it is an earthen house, you know, it's made out of mud, and, there's the Lone Ranger. I was curious about what he, what he was doing to get put behind bars. <laughs> and one of the challenges I had was to make a, a mask and make it look like it was woven with spruce roots. So I was talking with a master spruce root weaver up in Alaska about how to do this. And she was giving me advice about how to do it. And, um, we were going to collaborate, but she got too busy, and and later on she um, she passed on. But she saw it, and she really loved it. So so that's the best validation that I could have for this, is that a master you know weaver from my own tribe really loved the look of it, you know, the gas mask. And, and I'm thinking, wow, man, look at that. We're all wearing masks, you know, and. Uh, and I wanted to convert the Cadillac into a Tlingit one, too. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to put some Chilcat designs on it and change the chrome you know, to, to make it look like our own silver. And, uh, and of course, there's, there's the bike. 
Raven bears witness. Now, I had a fellowship about um, 10 years ago to work on this project. So one of the things I did was I traveled to different coal-powered plants around the country. And I had no idea how really nasty they were. <laughs> You know, when, when you actually go on location, and th that's one of them right there, that's one of the coal-powered plants, and it's in Illinois. And the moment you get there, it feels like the inside of your nose is burning. You know, and people live nearby there. You know, so I was wondering, how can these people live right nearby these power plants anyway? And it was one of the power plants that provides a lot of the electricity for the Midwest you know, for Chicago area. And um, so anyway, I photographed, I love infrared film. So this was shot with a Hasselblad and an infrared film, you know, so still love the analog, you know, photography. And I shot it with digital too, but digital just didn't work. You know, it just felt blase, you know, but, you know, pulled out the infrared camera and there it was, that was the look. Or even so this is from another series it's called the sacred series and um, it's been exhibited in a lot of places too and, and and this one came from a journal it's a series of five prints so I'm, I only have one of them here and it's titled um, sacred series so over the years I've been cordially invited to participate in a number of exhibitions many with titles like spirit capture, praising the spirit, spirit of Native America, and so on. I must be a spiritual expert, so I set out on a quest to gather spiritual power. <laughs> on my sacred journey, I found this sacred power pole. <laughs> the curators will be happy. <laughs> and, and the curators were happy, you know, so they framed it up and put it on the wall. So. So there it is, my sacred. Now I can say, you know what? I made sacred work. <laughs> and, and, and here it is. And uh, this one's titled White Raven Ceremonial. And it's, again, it's about the power plant, one of the big coal power plants. And over on the right is, you know, more of the, our spruce root basket design. And it comes from my own, they call it uh, tribal house. And I, I'm from the house, it's called Keek Gushi Hit. And that translates to Killer Well Finn House. And one of our common designs is, you know, that design over on the far right. And it's, we call it Killer Whale Teeth, you know. So, so, so I drew it and put it in as a layer over there. And there's um, a white raven in there. And it's looking into the empty head of a human wearing a mask. <laughs> and I think, yeah, there we have it. And... Uh, shot the raven with um, infrared film too and just by pure happenstance the raven's beak came out looking smudgy you see that and and i thought wow you know i didn't have to do anything to it that's just how it looked when i photographed the raven perfect and and this is another version of it um, this is for an exhibition i had at the smithsonian and um Again, about the global climate change, you know, and this is from their website. And the thing I liked about working with platinum like this was that it had this different look to it. You know, I always think, okay, why am I using this process? You know, either a silver print or a palladium print or a digital print or whatever. And um, this gave that murky look, you know, and, and, and I tried some test prints and I thought, you know what, this is, you know, I have to fix this. And I let it sit for a couple days. And I thought, you know what, this is how it's supposed to look. You know, so I made a lot of them look like this, you know, using platinum, uh, platinum process. And, and this one too, this was a collaboration uh, titled Man of the Bear Clan. And I photographed it up in Alaska in the, early uh, 80s, actually, this commission work. And, um, and I was working with David Michael Kennedy. He's, he's a master palladium printer who, who lives in New Mexico. And I needed to make large prints for this exhibition. And, and my darkroom was too small. 
You know, I could only make um, 11 by 14 prints, but I wanted to make these 36 inch wide ones. And of all my friends, he had the biggest lab, <laughs> you know, the, the biggest lab for making palladium prints. And, and he was really good at, you know, the coding and all that. So, so I always fully credit David too, you know, as the one who made this uh, series possible, you know, in, in palladium. Process, you know, I still use a four by five camera and I squirreled away some platinum, some Polaroid four by five film and it still works. You know, I'd keep it in my fridge and uh, does anybody else have any four by five? Yeah, maybe we could wheel a deal. <laughs> my supply is getting low. And uh, this is from a works in progress right now that I'm doing, you know, working in a studio and, you know, global climate change, working with cars and um, letting some of my secrets be known. You know, sometimes I shoot model cars. <laughs> and and I, I describe them as my toys. Yeah, I have to get these toys so I can do my work, you know. And, uh, and wanted to share this uh, photograph, Patrick Nagatani. He, was, he had so much to do with my own career, you know, both as a, an artist and as a professor, you know. And, yeah, I still consulted him up until the last time I saw him. And if you ever go off to Scotland, you can see my work at the National Museum of, of um, Scotland. And the cool thing is it's on permanent display there, you know, so they're pretty picky about what they put on permanent display. So, so that was kind of a cool thing. And this is, a, you know, something I did with Hasselblad about, um, being a master photographer. And this is from some work that I did with uh, National Geographic a number of years ago. So I served on their board, you know, as advisory board member with them. And uh, so that was really great work too. Uh, love working with other organizations and offering my input and so forth. And uh, yeah, good, okay. Um, looks like I'm about out of time. You know, so we, we, we do have time for a couple of questions. If anybody has any questions or comments. <laughs> yeah. Anybody want to know the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's grieving, that's right, yeah. I was continuing with the uh, global, global climate change work. And as a matter of fact, when COVID hit in January of 2020, I was in Bakersfield making photographs of, um, what do they call their oil pumps? You know, they're, they're yeah, so, so as they're making photographs traveling around California and um, COVID hit, so kind of, dashed home and so so for the past two years I've been working in in, in a converted studio at home and uh, continuing that stuff so so I'm kind of winging it just like everybody else <laughs> you know <laughs> working out of a home studio yeah are you still teaching yeah I'm still teaching I uh, just finished yesterday <laughs> and uh, yeah I, you know Teaching for me has, you know, been really great. I love the idea of, you know, I, I discovered I was good at teaching 30 years ago. You know, I'd, I had no idea how I'd do with it, you know, and teaching the first semester was really great, you know, and really connected with the students. And my own personal philosophy is that the world needs more artists. You know, so, so I feel like, you know, that's where a lot of, you know, us professors can do something real, you know, it's like, yeah, make more photographers, you know, make, <laughs> make more artists, you know, and, uh, and I still feel that way. And, 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 and it was inspired by other professors, too, because I know there's a lot of other, and teachers, high school teachers, you know, a lot of high school teachers are fantastic. You know, I know because I get their students the next year, you know, so fully credit them too, you know. Fantastic, thank you so much. Yeah. 
I yeah. Have a question. You have so many amazing layers in, in some of the work, and is that something that you're doing digitally to make it negative, or how does that process happen? Like with the most yeah. So the layers, you know, first of all, it comes straight from the narrative, from the story. You know, and, and I'll think about it before I pick up a camera. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll have that visual idea somewhat about halfway there. And the cool thing for me is that, you know, you start making the work and adding layers and looking at it, you go, wow, this, this is starting to look kind of cool. And, and then, you know, you realize, I realize that, hey, you know what, it needs this and this to complete it. And, and with some of the lithographs, you know, it was a little more regimented in that, you know, when I, when I sign up for the projects, they say, okay, you got six plates. And I said, what? What does that mean? <laughs> six, what's the main course? <laughs> and uh, so, so anyway, six plates. So, so I knew I had six layers to, to work with. And, you know, of course, you know, for, for people working in lithography, I, I noticed that you think a little differently. You know, you, you know that you have six plates, but in my opinion, it's a little bit um, more challenging, but you can wing it too. I, I like that part, just being able to wing it and see what happens. And, and you throw in the element of inks too, you know, and, um, and, and um, that's where working with the master lithographer was great too, because they'd be sitting there mixing the inks and I'd say, no, make it gold. <laughs> And, and they would, you know, that was, or, or no, 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 make it invisible. <laughs> so can't do that with digital photography yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah. yeah, any other questions? Well, good, looks like we finished right on time then. All right, well, well thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it.